Welcome to part two of my interview with deep state target George Papadopoulos. We left part one with a young Trump campaign enthusiast in a London wine bar, unaware that a solitary gin and tonic with the Australian High Commissioner Alexander Downer was about to change his life and launch, quote, the Russian investigation, unquote. I had rather more drinks with Mr. Downer, but I didn't wind up going to jail for it. Obama Defense Secretary Ash Carter and British Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson both met with mysterious Maltese professor Joseph Mifsud, but they didn't go to jail for it. George Papadopoulos did. Professor Mifsud dangles some Russian dirt in front of Papadopoulos, which he's supposed to regurgitate to Alexander Downer. As the MacGuffin, in Alfred Hitchcock terms, that justifies the United States government taking the unprecedented step of spying on the presidential campaign of its political opponents. My conversation with George Papadopoulos continues. The whole thing is a setup designed to make it look as if there's independent corroboration by friendly allies that Trump's working for the Russians. That's, that's absolutely correct. And uh, Downer himself, in interviews he's given publicly, mm. has stated that he never said emails. Mm. He said the word dirt. Mm. What does dirt mean? Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How do you jump logically from the word dirt <laughs> to five months later, he had foreknowledge that the DNC would be hacked. Yeah, yeah. Who didn't have dirt on Hillary Clinton yeah. by that point? The yeah. Chinese, the Iranians, uh, the world had dirt on her. No, I think by some count, 16 <laughs> intelligence services, friendly and unfriendly, broke into her server. That's one estimate. But, but not even that, because Downer himself said, I never said emails. Yeah, I huh. said the word dirt, yeah, uh. and William Barr, during his uh, testimony, I yeah. think last week, he stated the exact same thing I just said. How do you jump from the word dirt yeah. to emails? It make, it, there, you, you can't make the logic, logical assumption leading to the conclusion that the word dirt means the DNC would be hacked five months later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's what even William Barr was uh, questioning this. So let's assume I said dirt to Alexander Downer and he has it on tape. Oh, this guy is talking that the Russians have dirt on her. So what? How does that justify launching an investigation into the entire campaign unless there was already an investigation possibly into me individual, individually, and the campaign preceding July 31st? No, but what I find interesting, again, about you going around, you're being invited to drinks with these people and things, um, there's an effort to set you up. And for some reason, you're wandering naively, perhaps, through all these encounters. You yes. never quite deliver the goods. So you have, it seems pretty obvious, you're sitting there having a drink, and it seems pretty obvious to you that, uh, that the, the High Commissioner for Australia is uh, filming you on yes. his telephone. Uh, and you're, you nevertheless stay there and you're chit-chatting. But if they had, in fact, got that on film of you actually saying that to Alexander Downer, why would that not be in the Mueller report? Well, possibly for two reasons. Mm -hmm. The first is that, as I stated, the jump from dirt to emails makes no sense. Yeah. And secondly, if an Australian diplomat was spying on me, that's a world of trouble for the US-Australia relationship. 
And uh, I really, I highly recommend everyone watching this to read my testimony to Congress, mm. all 239 pages of it to the Oversight Committee. Mm. Last October, there were four witnesses invited to testify in front of the mm. House Oversight Committee in front of Mark Meadows, mm. John Radcliffe, and a couple Democrats. George Papadopoulos, Jim Comey, Sally Yates, and Loretta Lynch. Right. And people were scratching their heads. Why would George Papadopoulos be invited to testify in front of the House Oversight Committee about FISA abuse mm. with three officials who led the Department of Justice under the previous yeah. administration? And when you look through the transcript, you can see quite clearly the types of questions I'm being asked about recordings transcripts that were ever presented to me and about my meetings with Alexander Downer and Joseph Mifsud and Stefan Halper, which we'll mm. get to mm. later. And when Mark Meadows is asking me, and you could see it's public mm. now, and I, and I purposely didn't include it in my book mm. because it hadn't been released yet, yeah. but now that it's released, I yeah. can obviously talk about it. He's asking me point blank, were you ever presented with transcripts or recordings of your meetings with Joseph Mifsud, Alexander Downer, or anybody that you were encountering? And I said, no, what do you mean? And uh, he was nodding his head. And he said, uh, what kind of warrants do you think were on you? Mark Meadows mm, yeah, is asking yeah. me. And I said, uh, Congressman, I believe I had a FISA warrant on me. And he says, so you believe that it would have been impossible for the FBI and other intelligence agencies to understand what you were up to without a FISA? I said, yes, and he was nodding. So I think, Okay, and I was having a, an interview a couple days ago mm. where I stated the exact same thing. When Donald Trump, five months ago, suggested that he wanted to declassify FISA material, yeah. there were two U.S. allies who called him. And you think they okay. were... And when, and when these two U.S. allies yeah. called the President of the United States and implored him, yeah. please do not declassify FISA warrants yeah. or materials, I knew who those allies were. It was the U.K. and Australia, which I think have been revealed over the last yeah, couple yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah. Now here's the, here's the question that I raise. How on earth would the Australians and the British know what's in a FISA warrant in America? And you know who the only campaign official who was dealing with the Australians and the British were? Hmm. To the extent that I have to this day, Theresa May's letter of congratulations that she sent to Donald Trump when he was elected president, uh. me. So clearly what's in these warrants and in this FISA material regards the British and Australian involvement. And I think that's why when the president decided he would declassify, he got those two frantic calls from these people. And when he does declassify this material, this interview, this uh, transcribed interview I gave to Meadows is going to make a lot more sense when transcripts and potential recordings of my meetings with Australians and British officials are revealed. And I think that's what is going to come out. I don't think uh, uh, it's simply going to be some basic information about Carter Page or some other... No, thing. so you're, you're actually saying that someone in Washington is getting transcripts provided to them from London and Canberra of what you thought were private social engagements. Exactly. There's apparently no end to uh, the number of uh, uh, middle-aged men with attractive uh, female assistants who are interested in meeting you because you've had... Uh, Joseph uh, Mifsud, we've had Alexander Downer, and now this uh, so-called professor comes into your life, Stefan Halper. And uh, Mr. Halper uh, doesn't seem to be uh, unusually burdened by his professorial duties at Cambridge. And again, he's a guy with long, deep, decades-long connections uh, to the CIA and MI6. Yes, in uh, September of 2016, uh, I think I was in New York, mm. I received an unsolicited email in my inbox mm. from an individual named Stefan Halper, and I had no idea who this person was. So I uh, googled him and I saw that he worked uh, for four previous uh, U.S. administrations and uh, he was a Cambridge professor. And uh, in the email it stated, uh, I want to pay you $3,000 for you to write a report on the energy sector in Cyprus and Israel. Similarly, as I explained to what Downer wanted to know about as well, mm. besides some other issues, and you are a recognized expert on mm. this topic, and I want to fly you to London, and uh, it will be a short trip, just want to hear your thoughts, a 1500 word uh, paper, and uh, I'll send you on your way. 
And I had a girlfriend in London at the time. Mm. Uh, I, I was living in London mm. before I moved to New York, so I was obviously very well acquainted with London, and uh, I was happy to get back and get paid mm. to do something that, that's how I made my money at the time, mm. giving uh, speeches, attending conferences, and writing uh, policy mm. reports. So I thought nothing of it mm. until uh, I fly to London and I'm put up in this five-star accommodation. Um, and Halper emails me and he puts a woman in the chain mm. named Azra Turk. Mm. And it didn't make sense to me um, because my policy positions throughout my career were very hostile to Turkey. Mm. And it was obviously a Turkish name. Mm. He didn't notify me ahead of time that another person would be involved in whatever this uh, fake operator, this mm. operation mm. was. And he said, so she's going to meet you at the Konat Hotel. Con Konat Kono Hotel. Kono, yeah, Kono yeah, Hotel. Yeah. Another beautiful five-star. Yeah, fabulous uh, hotel. Yeah. In Mayfair next yeah. to the U.S. Embassy mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wants to meet you for drinks. And I said, okay, I have no issue. If she's your assistant, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I get there. I text whoever this Azra person is. And I say, I'm wearing a red tie. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you can't miss me. I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, I have a red tie. And you can't miss me. I'll mm -hmm. be at the, at the mm -hmm. lounge waiting for you. And a stunning, uh, mm -hmm. beautiful blonde walks into the room, uh, smiling and... Uh, too happy to meet to see me actually mm. and um, you know fortunately I had a girlfriend at the time in London so I wasn't thinking other things except let's figure out what this business I'm supposed mm. to be doing is until she started to be almost aggressively flirtatious with me and uh, you know holding my hand or trying to hold my hand yeah uh, you know she's being a little bit too tactile to someone who's never met you before not only never met me mm. Mm. but supposedly a Cambridge mm. assistant mm. who was here for a business deal with me mm. or I'm here on a business mm. trip mm. I'm not here on a uh, you know adventure with her mm. and mm. I was a bit laughing and she started to ask me similar questions as about um, my professional background in the Middle East Israel Cyprus Turkey mm. but then she wanted to know about Trump in Russia and of course by September 2016 mm. after I of course had been profiled for mm. months and probably had my emails hacked and mm. uh, wiretapped and uh, all the intelligence agencies in the world by September 2016 knew who Donald Trump's people were, they would have known by then I had no Russia contacts. Okay, mm. of course. Mm. Mm. By that point, it would have been unfathomable for them to believe that George Papadopoulos had even one Russia contact, okay? Mm. But they were still asking me about emails in Russia. Now how, right. would, now, how would they know to ask me these questions unless they were provided information beforehand by Joseph Mifsud? But, but just, just to go back to the, the flirting and the touching, yeah. do, you, do you think this is actually the old sort of CIA honey trap thing? The idea is that uh, you should have wound up uh, going upstairs to one of the delightfully appointed rooms at the Connaught and uh, that, uh, that that was the object of the exercise. That was the object of the exercise. That's why, uh, one, I never bought the narrative that she was FBI. Right. And in fact, the New York Times, uh, after they were asked point blank by CNN, was she FBI? Mm. Adam Goldman, the one of the reporters who uh, mm. broke the broke the story, that was already obviously in my book yeah, for months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, "I can't say she was FBI. I will leave it as government inf inspector or something like that." So for me, it reeked of CIA. Yeah. And given that she was a Turkish national, uh, very flirty, and mm. barely spoke proper English. I believe she could have been collaborating well, let me, with a different intel agency as well. Yeah, let me ask you about that because again, it's fascinating to me. She's been presented as someone. When the story broke uh, in the New York Times, it, 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 watching the news coverage, you got the impression that she was a US government employee. She wasn't. And your account says she can barely speak English. So does that make her more of a US government Asset. I think she was likely foreign intelligence that was farmed out, mm. being run by the CIA mm. to essentially sleep with me, mm. to dirty me up and me in a moment of passion to say, oh yeah, I know all about Russian and emails yeah, yeah, to impress yeah, her yeah. about information, yeah. of course, I had no idea about. 
But that was the point of this. So similarly to Mifsud yeah. giving me this fake information to be retrieved later. And um, fortunately, um, I was suspicious of, of her immediately because she had the feel of an agent. I felt it right away. I didn't feel, as I explained to you, because she was a Turkish national, uh, her English wasn't well, she was too flirty, and she knew nothing about the topic at hand that I was being paid to. So, talk so to. in other words, she's supposed to be some kind of professorial assistant. Yes, a Cambridge assistant, actually. Yeah, Very uh, uh, the PhD uni- level. Yeah, no, so it's not like a diploma mill in uh, the middle of wherever. It's, uh, a, it's supposedly a real university, and they've sent you this rather strange and unconvincing person. I, again, wh- again, most of us only know things about the CIA from movies, but we watch the movies and over many years, certain things recur. They seem to have tried all the basic tricks with you. Uh, the, the business with Alexander Downer's telephone where you don't quite say the line that they want you to say. So that's a strike for them. Uh, then we have this, uh, the, uh, the old honeypotting routine. And again, you don't take the bait. You don't go upstairs to the room at the Connaught. And then we have the other thing uh, where you're, <laughs> you mysteriously wind up being given uh, $10,000 in cash and uh, you wisely conclude that this is a suspicious, uh, there's something odd about this. And so you give the cash, I think, to your lawyer in yes. Greece yes. Uh, for safekeeping. And then you fly back to the United States, you land in Washington, and you're seized by FBI agents at the airport who go through your luggage yes. <clears throat> uh, looking for, apparently looking for 10 grand that isn't there. That's absolutely correct. Um, I was arrested in what I call a savage-like manner. Mm. Um, shackled. Shackled uh, as if I was uh, a terrorist or a narco trafficker. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Maybe they were treated better than I was, quite frankly. At least they might have had their Miranda rights read to them. Yeah. They might have been told that you're being under you're under arrest for nar- trafficking drugs or women or, no, and, and this, or terrorism. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is actually disgraceful. This is a U.S. citizen. Out of the blue, he lands at Washington and he's taken away. And, he, uh, and as, as you say, you're shackled uh, as, as if you just attempted to hijack the plane or whatever. Completely. Um, and, uh, and, and even if everything anyone has said about you is true, uh, the most it means is that you're kind of a uh, white collar staffer on the Trump campaign who's colluding with Russia, but there's no, uh, nothing on that basis to justify the shackling uh, of your of your ankles, so they they're coming down hard on you because because they expect to find something in your luggage. They were expecting to find this ten thousand dollars from a different CIA asset. Mm. Who, if you Google this man Charles Tawell, mm, mm. WikiLeaks has him as a CIA asset in South Africa. Right. He gave me ten thousand dollars in a shady hotel room in Tel Aviv yeah. uh, about a business deal that we were supposed to be working and, on. And this was supposedly like a retainer. Some retainer I've... But in, instead of writing a check, he conveniently has 10 grand in cash on him. And that's why I flew to Greece the next day and I said, please get your money, don't contact me again. Yeah. And he said, I don't want my money. So right away I understood. And, and, and just to be clear, anyone crossing a US border, if they do it fairly regularly, will be asked by a customs agent at some point or other, do you have $10,000 or more in cash or convertible instruments? And they took me before I could declare it if I had it. Yeah. And that was the the whole setup. So clearly, this was obviously an operation. And Mm. what's very good for, I guess, the investigations moving forward is I Mm. still have the money in a safe in Athens that my lawyer is uh, safeguarding right now. And explain to me... (laughs) Uh, why that's good because the, the, the fact is you've still got those bills yes. and those uh, I don't know whether they're twenties or fifties hundreds, hundreds. hundreds those hundred dollar bills all have numbers on them they all have numbers on them um, I have been contacted by a congressional committee mm. I don't want to name who but you could imagine who no. uh, who wants to review the bills right. and um, there's tremendous suspicion that those bills are marked and they might actually lead 
to the Treasury Department. Well, they do, it's American bills, but it might coincide with an operation that was run at me. And if it indeed was an operation where I was being entrapped again with money that I never brought back with me, and then I was arrested with agents looking for this money, I think it's gonna open up a whole new can of worms for the FBI. And uh, I'm pretty sure this topic is going to become a lot more front page news probably in the next two or three months than it is right now. Let, let's, let's step back and, and look at the big picture here because yes. what, what I think, um, what seems to me pretty obviously to have happened is that people at the highest levels in the national security state decided early on uh, to surveil a major party presidential campaign, which has never happened before in US history. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about Barry, Goldwater, uh, or whoever. No one's ever done this uh, before. And so, uh, because that's actually quite a brazen thing to do, uh, they decided at some point it would be uh, interesting if as much of it could be offshored as much as possible uh, to, to uh, fellow members of the Five Eyes uh, Intelligence uh, Alliance. And then they're looking for the mark. And yes, there are people who do have connections, who go to Russia all the time. There are people, people like Manafort and people who are like flying in and out doing deals, no warlords. You know very few Russians. Uh, you actually, uh, your contacts in a, a different part of the world. But in a sense, one gets the feeling that in a sense, because, because precisely because you don't have ties to the Russians or to Kazakh warlords or whatever, precisely because of that, you're sort of a blank sheet on which they can impose yes. a paper trail. Is that, is that what they were doing to you over those months in, uh, in the UK? That's what it looks like because as you stated, not only, you said I, I have few Russian contacts, mm. I have zero mm. Russian contacts. Mm. To this day, I've never met a Russian official in my entire life. I've right. never even traveled to Russia. No. Okay, my, my wife was characterized as a Russian spy to try no. and fit me into this bizarre narrative. No, no, no I mean it, that's to the, the that's where that, that's how incredible the science. No, no, I, was. like I, I've been I've been to Russia. My daughter uh, spent uh, the, the, a, as a student spent a summer in St. Petersburg. I think it was last year or the year before. So I mean I'm colluding up to the hilt. But you're actually the the one person who Russia wise is a virginal creature. Well, that's why this entire operation was clearly a psyop, I believe, to confuse Americans and to paint me as somebody who I obviously was not. But unfortunately, once the evidence is stacked up to scrutiny, in my case, it can't stand because the evidence suggests that this man has no Russian contacts. Yeah. So how on earth could he be patient zero of a Russia conspiracy, no matter how hard you tried to manufacture it around him? And that's why even people like uh, on CNN are calling to ask me questions because it makes no sense. No, it no. makes and, absolutely no sense. And, Zero. And, it, and it's more than that, isn't it? Because in, if there, if in fact the Russia investigation is was a mere cover for what was actually going on, which That's is what I think was which is the government surveillance of its political opposition then you are patient zero for that because you were intended at, at every, you were intended either to be found sleeping uh, with uh, some mysterious exotic Mata Hari type at the Connaught Hotel, mm -hmm. or you were intended to be landing in Washington uh, with uh, excess, uh, excess amounts of uh, cash for which you had no plausible explanation. And simply because, either because you're an incredibly virtuous person uh, or because, you know, your, your antennae are tingling, you don't take the bait, no matter how often they dangle it. And so in the end, they get you for misre misremembering to the FBI. And pathetically, pathetically, Muller says that, oh, because you misremembered to the FBI, this, uh, this uh, was in the early stages of the investigation, so it pre prevented the Mueller Money No Object team from being able to pursue all their leads thoroughly. Well, That's basically what the indictment... But, uh, but it's the, incredible, Mark, because during my initial interview with the FBI, mm -hmm. I volunteered to them that Joseph Mifsud told me this information about hacked emails. Yeah, yeah. 
Yet Joseph Mifsud was living in London openly, meeting with Boris Johnson for a year after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it was that hard for MI5 to go question him if he was seen as such a threat. No, no. So of course this man was in on this operation. That's why he's gone underground until recently. The Italians have outed him, yeah, living yeah. next to the U.S. Embassy in Rome, being protected by them. And now, uh, is that coincidence, or do you think that is... That's uh, this guy who disappeared from the face of the earth. I think it was last October or something. He had dinner with uh, Boris Johnson and was like vaporized. You know, I've had dinners with Boris that made me feel like that, but I didn't actually vanish from the face of the earth. This guy <laughs> did. He was basically being protected by U the US government and its allies so they could, uh, in other words, so that you would be the designated fall guy yeah. and he wouldn't be around to be questioned on that. But unfortunately for him, mm. ever since uh, I've gone public with my story mm. and I, on various other interviews, I've explained that he's living openly in, yeah. in Rome. I don't think it was a coincidence last week and when the president called the Italian prime minister <laughs> right. to discuss uh, immigration. Yeah, as Donald yeah. Trump stated on his Twitter account, uh, so I'm pretty sure, and obviously Devin Nunes, yeah, his no, letter no, no, about no. Mifsud, and I've received correspondence from that office. I think they're zeroing in on him. They're going to get him to testify, and the Italians are going to make him uh, available to uh, detail who he was working for, what the motivations were, and um, where and how he's been hiding for the last two years. Well, let me, let me um, come back to to a, a final point about this because we the, the spy stuff is is interesting although I should think when you realize it's going on as you eventually did it's also terrifying yes Alexander Downer uh, tweeted uh, in a sense a sort of exculpatory tweet I think that's what he was trying to do and he, he the, the other day and he said oh well when when everybody's had their fun um, in fact, it, it was Mr. Papadopoulos who brought up the thing. And I was very struck by that phrase, when everybody's had their fun. Because for Alexander Downer, it's fun. For Robert Mueller, it's fun. For Rachel Maddow on MSNBC, it's fun. But this thing has actually destroyed your life and sent you to jail. Um, and one of the most shocking things toward the end of the book is uh, you reveal <coughs> that uh, your, your, your wife, um, that, that she actually uh, miscarried during this period when Alexander Downer and Rachel Maddow and uh, everybody else is having all their fun at your expense. So there were real, the, this imposed real stress on you and your loved ones. That's a, that's a very, well, I don't want to call it a good point, but it's a, I want to talk about that actually mm. because it's a, very, it's a very disturbing anecdote for what we did go through. The day that um, the FBI was harassing mm. my family and my then girlfriend, now wife, mm. <coughs> we didn't know that she was pregnant. Mm. I didn't know, she didn't know. And the FBI and Mueller subpoenaed her uh, mm. and came to my home in Chicago before my name even went public, because mm. she knew too much about Mifsud. Remember mm. the connections to Italy? Yeah, yeah. She knew yeah, too much about she's him. She's Italian, and uh, I think she practiced as a lawyer in she, uh, Italy. And she knew Mifsud, mm. and that's a, it's a long story why I covered in my book. Mm. And I believe the FBI subpoenaed her, and Mueller subpoenaed her, so that they would scare her to not explain to me what Joseph Mifsud was and who he was. Mm. So the day that the FBI came to my door and subpoenaed her, and she had her interview with Mueller at the Chicago office, where they were harassing her and telling her to basically leave George, he's finished, and uh, don't talk about his case to anyone, and to actually spy on me. This is something I've never spoken about publicly. Mm. The FBI asked my then girlfriend to spy on me for them, and she's, they said he's in a lot of trouble, spy on him and give us everything you know about him. And the day that she left that interview, she miscarried. We went to the hospital, and so for me, uh, you know, it was, a traumatic experience and um, you know maybe it was my fate to finally expose this um, event and this disturbing event in modern American history as, as I am now and why I think uh, so much of this story did go through me but it was a very dark period to go from where I began mm -hmm. with my girlfriend now wife to where we are now 
having the platforms that I've been very grateful but and you, given to expose this. But you two are married. Yes. She loves you, you love her. This awful, awful investigation that has concluded there was no collusion. So in other words, they all wasted their time. But nevertheless, in wasting their time, in wasting the American taxpayers' time, the American people's time, they nevertheless destroyed a lot of lives. And, and you're saying that on this day, they're, they're lean, and I can imagine what that's like. We know what it's like when the FBI have got you in a room, you don't have a lawyer, you don't have a, you know, they're trying to turn you. And they're trying to turn the woman you love into screwing you over. Yes. Uh, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, their, uh, their interrogation techniques are very forceful and, you know, one can't establish precise causation. But later that day, uh, Simona uh, miscarried. Yes, it was a traumatic experience and, um, you know, you can't forget it. And she can't forget it. It traumatized her. I'm surprised that she ended up staying with me after mm. that because this was October right. of 2017. Yeah. Um, when this happened. Yeah. And um, she stayed with me, and not only did she stay with me, she ended up fighting for me and going on various TV oh, no, outlets. She's, uh, I love it whenever <laughs> you see her on uh, with uh, Tucker or whatever. Yeah, she's, it, it, she's feisty. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I would, no matter what resources Robert Mueller brings to bear, uh, <laughs> I would not bet on her being someone easy, uh, easy to turn in that respect. Yeah. But where do you want to go with this now? Do you want to be, I mean, there are consequences even to spending uh, two weeks in jail. Do you, want, do you want a presidential pardon? Is that that's what you're working towards? I'm working on exposing what happened mm. to me and uh, to hopefully remove this benighted mark on American modern political history. And by getting my story out there on platforms like yours and others mm. and letting Americans understand who I am and what my real involvement was in this mm. entire setup against the duly elected mm. president, because of course I was the mark. Right. I wasn't the end game. Right. The end game was a soft coup d'etat attempt against the sitting president. Yeah. And I think now that Donald Trump is even tweeting about me and quoting yeah. me about this case, he's obviously watching very closely. And uh, if he believes it's a witch hunt the way he does and that his team was set up, including Michael Flynn, mm. um, of course, I have no expectation for a pardon. But uh, of course, I'd be very happy to, to receive one. But uh, I'm not holding my breath. No, certain things need to change. Uh, you, you know, you don't. You you pleaded guilty to something. It's not a, a entirely clear what it is that you were guilty of. But again, people should understand this. If you're people say, well, if he was so innocent, why didn't he uh, have his day in court? Uh, the the federal government wins ninety nine percent of the cases it takes to trial. You're essentially yes. faced with the choice of being ruined or even more ruined. That's the choice Bob Mueller gave you. That's exactly correct. And, and I want to make it very clear that it wasn't simply a lying charge. Mm. He went to the extent to have a formal charge of me working as an Israeli agent, a FARA violation, right, right. which he wrote in his report. Yeah. And I've tweeted his the segment in the report yeah. that many reporters e either conveniently overlooked or they just didn't read it. Yeah. But I had an obstruction charge levied against me yeah. for deleting a Facebook account. Right, right. Or you can't delete a Facebook account, you deactivate a Facebook right, account right. after my lawyer told me yeah. to. Lying about when I met somebody, yeah. I, which wasn't even really a lie. Yeah. And this bizarre charge of me working as an unregistered agent of the Israeli government. Yeah, yeah. So after you, <laughs> you've had five months of interrogation and your brain beaten with a bat for hours and hours by these prosecutors, and you've spent six figures in law fees, mm. legal mm. fees, which I did, and mm. that's basically what I had. Mm. No. And then they tell you, eh, we're at the point now where if you don't plead guilty, we're gonna level, levy these charges on you and you're gonna have to spend a million dollars, which yeah. I didn't have, yeah. on a trial. So it's, yeah, not, as, and it's 70, not as simple as that. There's 73 counts and you're looking at 475 years in jail. It, it, it's an but, incredible, it's the injustice of the justice system. Yeah, no, and when, when you say, they say you're an unregistered agent of a foreign government, I'd love to know which uh, government these guys are actually agents of because they're not operating in the interests of the United States government 
or the American people. I agree. Uh, what was done to you was uh, disgraceful, George, and I uh, congratulate you on your perseverance Thank in you. exposing a lot of this. The book is called Deep State Target. It's a cracking read. It's written vividly in uh, the present tense. And uh, if anyone from Paramount or Universal is watching, it would make a cracking movie. <laughs> uh, or, or maybe uh, just to be on the safe side if you're a foreign movie producer. Because uh, who knows who they've got sitting in the Hollywood boardrooms. But this is, this is a terrific story. Uh, Deep State Target by George Papadopoulos. George, uh, keep fighting. Uh, you were sorely traduced by terrible people in your own government. Uh, and eventually it will all come out and this book will be a big part of it. Thank Thanks you very so much indeed. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank I really you. appreciate everything you've Thanks. done. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. We'll see you next time.